What I'd like to do um, is first uh, give you a little bit of a background on how this whole project just came about. And, and then that's kind of uh, tie all of this thing together. Um, I was brought up with Western music. Just many of people who come here to Western music, I happily played Bach and went to a Tehran Conservatory, happily played Bach and Beethoven. Then, barely 17, went to Vienna. I was accepted in the Academy of Music in Vienna, I happily played Bach and Beethoven. And came to the United States, was accepted in the University of Pittsburgh, happily played Bach and Beethoven, and Schoenberg, and you know, Weber, and so on. And, but while I was doing that, um, I was also preoccupied with Persian folk music, which is my passion. And working on Persian folk music, I realized that there is a kind of a hidden power. It's like a nuclear power underneath that holds the entire Persian mu you know, music together. And this nuclear power is Persian classical music, is the system of Daskal. So I start studying the Daskal. And you know, I, when I went through, it virtually blew my mind. I realized that I'm confronting the, one of the most sophisticated and one of the most advanced music in the world. And that constantly, when I was, you know, when I was actually studying the music, I was saying, why I was not taught this? You know, I went to the, you know, what was my teacher was thinking? They didn't even teach me one note about this thing. And so then I realized, well, if I want to study Persian music, I have to play an instrument. I don't play an Persian instrument. So what if I started playing santur? You know, I have studied 30 years of Western music. If I want to study, you know, I studied santur. By the time I become 1,000 of the technique of Dr. Salavi, I would be 95 years old. So. It really started really getting down on me, and you know I came very close to just leave the Western music altogether and just go. But then, how can I leave Western music? How, how could you leave Brahms? How could you leave you know Debussy? So and then it came to my mind technology. I could actually you know use technology to produce the tuning of the Persian music which I will explain to you is a completely different tuning. And actually, you know, do what I'm going to start, you know, learning Persian music, just using the technology. So I got together a, um, a keyboard, and I got together some of these uh, synthesizers that produce really awful sound that they use in rock and roll and, and pop music, but they could, I could tune them. So I started actually learning Persian music. And then one thing led to another, I cobbled together, um, uh, 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 grants, you know, uh, small grants, and one thing led to another, and finally I found Eric, who helped helped me tremendously to put this together. And as I grow up, you know, the industry grow too. So we, uh, I just got together to produce uh, the instrument and then put together the instrument that I would like to uh, introduce to you. Um, then I called uh, uh, the name of the uh, you know, uh, instrument, I called it Argonun. Argonun is the Persian translator, uh, transliteration of the Latin word organum. And we actually will talk about the Argonun, and we call it actually, if this comes to it, uh, one time uh, in the future come to the market, we call it Argo. Just kind of make it smaller. And sometimes I say Argonun, sometimes I say Argo. Uh, I mean that, okay? Um, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm just a humble composer. So, you know, uh, uh, we are, and also, we are at the beginning of this uh, process. We still have a lot to go, but I'm very glad we are here. So, before starting to introduce the uh, Argo, Argonum, I want to just give you a little bit of a background about Persian music, and I want to try to make it as short as possible so that we have to actually cover um, everything. I'm going to go on with actually a very short uh, history of uh, Persian music. Persian music is one of the oldest continuing music in the world. It goes back about to 
2,000 years. Um, the, the, uh, we don't know really um, with the earliest uh, uh, examples of Persian music, but what we have, we know is from the Sasanian Empire, the Persian Empire of AD 226 to 642. Uh, during the uh, uh, Sasanian Empire, especially at the court of Emperor Khosro II, or called Khosro Paris from 590 to 628, a very elaborate musical system was developed in, um, during the court. They had, uh, the Khosro II had like, it said that he had 2,000 musicians on his court. And this system, it was called the Dastan system. The Dastan uh, con uh, consisted of seven royal modes called Khosrovani, 30 derivative modes uh, called Lah, and 360 melodies called Dastan. Uh, these modes were played actually on, on different days, and different specific days, and different, sometimes different time of days. Does that remind you of another uh, music? that is, has a different mode for every hour. What music is that? Indian. The Indian music, yes, of course. So since the Indian music is very much related to Persian music, essentially the old Persian music is very much actually had very similar system to Indian music. By 642, the, uh, the Persian Empire actually was attacked and occupied by the uh, attacking Muslim uh, Arabs and essentially became part of the Islamic Empire. But these musicians who were at the, uh, these courts actually uh, spread throughout the Islamic Empire. The Islamic Empire was you know, from the southern Spain all the way to the border of China and essentially influenced tremendously, the, had, had a major influence on the development of um, of the uh, music of the Middle East as, as a whole. Uh, also, another thing that it was very important for uh, the music uh, musical system was that a uniform system of music throughout the Middle East actually was uh, developed, which lasted until 16th century. And uh, this uh, uniform uh, uh, music was called the Makam. Uh, the Makam system essentially was uh, uh, influenced by the Dastan system, plus the influences of those um, uh, countries that this system was spread, you know, like North Africa and mid other countries of the Middle East, of melting these two systems together, uh, or, or the Dastan system with the music of those uh, other cultures, the Makam system came uh, to being. And this lasted until 16th century. Essentially, what you played in Cordoba was very much uh, what you played in, uh, in Cairo, and very similar what you played in Baghdad, or very similar what you played in Isfahan. So uh, we know that European music was international during the 18th century, and have a very similar system. What that really was uh, uh, in the Middle East from uh, the from the 8th century all the way to the 16th century. Uh, in 16th century, something politically happened that is very important. Two uh, enormous superpower of the time came to being. Uh, the Ottoman Empire in the west and the Safavid Empire in the east, in the Persian Empire. After 400 years of occupation, essentially by different uh, uh, invading people, the Persians actually became again, uh, create a dynasty that was Persian, and that was the Safavid dynasty. The Safavid and the Ottomans, the Safavid was Shiite, and the Ottomans were Sunnis, and they clashed for 70 years with each other. And essentially, the Ottomans were very aggressive. They went all over, and they, they occupied the entire um, uh, former uh, Islamic empire. They took the North Africa, they took you know, the Middle East, they took you know, all, all these, and they went all the way to the gate of Vienna. They were stopped at Vienna in the west and at the Persian border, Iranian border in the east. So this hostility, this political hostility actually created a wall that musicians could not actually move 
Until now, the musician could actually move very freely to different chords. But now, the musician could not uh, freely move. And therefore, the, um, essentially, uh, the Persian music was separated from the rest of Middle East and had to actually, from 1502 to 1736, and even later, it had to actually develop by itself. So in this kind of isolation, um, Persian music actually has started to become uh, an entity by itself. And also a repersonalization of um, the music took a place. And some of the modes that was very fami fami uh, familiar all throughout the Middle East, which was not, it was pushed aside. Some of the other ones actually was taken. And essentially, uh, from the mid 18th century, a new system came to being, which was called the Daskar system. The Daskar system is actually, uh, goes back. Essentially then, now if we wanted to put the Persian music we will go to the Asra system, which is uh, the recent one, 18th, to 19th, 18th century, Makam system, and then the Astan system. Goes this as a chain reaction, and uh, in a chain, it goes actually um, back. Now I want to talk very, very briefly about the meaning of Daska. Daska comes from two words. Das, hand, and Ga means the place. Place of hand, what does that mean? It actually means place of finger. Because in the older, in the medieval music, it was the notations and the early notations was not what note you play, rather than what finger you are putting on what uh, place of, on the string. Okay? So then the asko essentially comes from the, uh, from the meaning of the finger, actually the fingering on the lute type instruments. We have seven dasko on the next page on your handout. You have actually the, uh, the dasko. We have seven daskos, and these are the scale of which I have I have written, and these are called Shur, Mahur, Homayun, Sega, Charga, Ras Panjga, and Navo. And there are five avas. I will tell a little bit what the avas and dasko is in a second. Uh, the Avaz is Abu Atta, Bayat Tur, Dashti, and Afshari, and Bayat Esfahan. The Daskas are one of the largest Daska, which is like a uh, mother, they call it the mother of all Daskas, is Shur, the first one. And this one has satellite. It has actually four satellites. Like Jupiter has all these moons, so the Shur has four satellites. And these four satellites are Avaz number one, two, three, and four. Abu Atta, Bayat Atur, Dashti, and Afshari. These are satellites of Shur. And one actually, uh, that's called Homayun, uh, which is number three, has a satellite, which is the Bayat Esfahan. So these, um, essentially, this uh, Dasko and Avaz makes the repertoire of the, um, of the Iranian system. Now, to explain the, uh, the system, I have to go a little bit more uh, you know, into uh, a little bit more. The, the Persian system, unlike the system of the neighbors, like the Arabic and the Turkish music, is not really based on scales, but is based on a very small unit, which has four notes, and that is called dong. Dong is basically tetrachord. Okay? It's the smallest unit of the music. Essentially, tetrachords join each other to create a scale. Tetrachords can be conjunct and disjunct. And there are different types of tetrachords. Now, in the past, if you ask a, a Persian music, a master to play a scale, they would not actually know what you're talking about. What they actually do is they memorize this dong according to certain melodic uh, melodic uh, formulas, which I will uh, uh, talk about it in a, in a second. And these tetrachords actually connect to each other, and there are, they move to each other. Sometimes they join to each other, sometimes they actually move. So think about a house. A house is made on very small bricks. You put these small bricks on top of each other, and you finally create a, a house. Okay? In order to uh, show you uh, how this works. So let's say a dong will be um, a small okay, unit. 
then you add these small units together. Then you add, you know, you push together, you get actually a super unit. Okay? And then adding more to this, you create actually another umbrella. And then adding more and more. So gradually you start from a very small and gradually you come up with actually larger and larger units. Okay? In a second, I will actually uh, 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 introduce uh, a little bit how that actually works in actual uh, uh, in the uh, in the system. Here is here is a scale of the mode of homoion. This is the first dunk. Okay. Now each is, and you will see the two dunks are conjunct. I'm sorry. This two tears, and then you have a disjunct. Uh, so this is the tonic of the skin, where actually all the everything that happens comes back to this, the phenomenon. Okay. Then there are actually notes in the system that are repeated and emphasized. The most emphasized note. I call it dominant, but I don't mean the tonic dominant in Western system. Okay. So one of the, do the dominant note, the most repeated uh, mo uh, uh, note, is called Shahed. One of them is this, but Shahed actually changes. It's liquid as we are moving. Another one is this. Okay. And then finally one of them, when you move to the octave, it will be this. So the most the most repeated note, it depends on where in the performance you are constantly moves. Okay? So we we'll learn, so we have, but then the music, no matter how this, what happens is as the musician perform and improvise, the music moves throughout the system and then, but then it has to come back to the finales. And this is actually done by a melodic formula called forut. Forut literally means descent. That means no matter where you are, you descend on the time. It reminds me that uh, an Austrian music theorist by the name of Heinrich Schenker actually said that in actually Western music. No matter what you do in Western music, you always descend to the time. And that might be actually because this music, because in essence, maybe they are related. So that, that is also true in Western music. You descend to the tonic, okay? Even on the surface, you hear as everything ascending, but really literally in the background, you descend to the tonic. In Persian music, you literally physically descend to the tonic. And the tonic called finalis, and this is called forud. Now, now we want to talk about the tuning and intervals. Persian music is not based on what we call the equal temperament. And that was actually the base of this really research because the Western music is based on equal temperament. And equal temperament means that all 12 notes in, this, in the octave are exactly, um, uh, exactly 100 cents. So you divide the octave into 1200 cents and every half a step is 100 cents. The Persian music is not that. Persian music is based on Pythagorean intervals and intervals uh, actually derived from the overtone partials, especially the 11th and 13th partial. And so therefore we have different type of intervals that do not match with the Western interval. A semitone, a semitone or a minor second is 90 cents Sense, by the way, is the measurement of interval. A half a step, the one that you see between the, uh, between the white and black notes, are 100 cents. So um, a minor second or a semitone is 90 cents, uh, which essentially uh, uh, so-called the Pythagorean lima. Then we have a small neutral tone, which is about 135 cents. That means it's, a, it's actually larger than a half a step, but it's, uh, it's smaller than a whole, whole step. Okay? 
when we introduce them, uh, the instrument, you will hear actually these. Then we have a large neutral tone, which is about 160 cents, is actually a smaller than a whole step. Uh, a smaller than a whole step, but larger than a half a step. Okay? Now, um, then we have a whole tone or major second, which is a, 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 about 204 cents, a slightly larger than the equal temperament. And the, finally, we have an interval, which is 270 cents, uh, uh, or between 267 and 270 cents, which we call the plus tone. This is what is actually mis mistaken in, um, in equalized, in equal temperament by what we call the augmented, you know, the augmented second chord. The augmented second is not really the, in, uh, the, um, the interval that used in Persian music. It's slightly, actually, the augmented second chord is 300 cent. But this interval is slightly smaller, about 30 cent is smaller. And then underneath of that, you will see the sign, which is like a backward uh, flat, called koron. Lowers a note about a little bit more than a quarter to one, about 50 to 60 cents. And a sign which is like a sharp with an accent inside it, called sori, raises a note about 55 to 60 cents, about a quarter to one. These are the note notations that were actually adopted in early 20th century by uh, a great Persian musician named Ali Nabi Vazi and it actually now established as the notation. Now I'm going to get to the organization of that scope. This melodic dawn that we discussed over here, each of these tetrachord is actually memorized by a melodic formula. This melodic formula is called Gushe. Gushe means corner. Literally cornered means that when you, uh, you know, when you're playing the Persian music, it's like you are actually in a huge place that has many, many different ways, and you have to find your ways. It has a little bit of philosophic and maybe mystic, uh, uh, you, know, you know, undertone of that. That you have to find your way through all these, all these like a maze, and you have to go through this maze and find your ways. Okay, and. So essentially, Gushe means corner. Gushe has the following function. Uh, either is a variation of a basic melodic pattern that we use, or a temporary cadential shift to another degree of the mode, or a complete variation, a uh, modulation, either to another segment of the mode or to another mode. Okay? But essentially, you are going uh, when you're actually starting, the first gushe actually comes over here, then second gushe actually moves over here, the third gushe might move here, and many, many other gushes, it expands and moves up and essentially creates a, some kind of an arch form that you start from the bottom and the finale, you go up in the register and just comes down like this. And come back, always you come back to actually the, to the finale. Then we have something called teke or pieces. Teke is a genre piece that it's inserted through the performance. In order to keep the performance alive, the musician actually creates something rhythmic. It constantly inserts something inside, okay, that has a, some kind of a character. And this is called a teke. Uh, uh, a teke can be a melodic genre read. It could be a, something a rhythmic, and all of a sudden, when the uh, performer, uh, when the master perform, you know, improvise, because this is all improvised, all of a sudden it starts actually playing with a genre. I mean, let's say, you know, you're you're playing a sonata, and all of a sudden you do a waltz. Or well, waltz is a genre piece. You, keep, you know, people will say, oh wow, you're playing a waltz, and then it goes back and playing a sonata. Something, something very, something similar, like, but, but very. It, this is sound very strange in Western music. But in Eastern, in Persian music, it's, it's not as strange at all, okay? And also, a, a text could be a text or a text or poetry related uh, genre piece. And then finally, um, also, I'm, at this point, I want to actually to play for you an example of the repertoire. And I'm going to explain to you what actually it's doing. This is from the ro ro vocal repertoire of 
Master Mahmoud Karimi, one of the great vocal master in Persian music. And it's in the mode of Homayun. And the notation is in your hand. What he does, he actually, in the, in the introduction, called Daromat. In the introduction, he actually only uses these three notes plus the second and third notes maybe down here. In the second gushe called Chakovac, he moves and the fourth degree of the scale becomes the dominant. And then in the next gushe called Bidad, the fifth degree of the scale becomes dominant. And finally, in the last gushe that is in this uh, uh, handout is called Ayat Raje or Raje. The octave, he moves up all the way to the octave and then gradually descends down. And at the end of the uh, singing, you will see here that he actually descends, virtually descends to the tonic all the way down. So we will play the first one that there are about.
Boucher called Vida, now the, um, the dominant actually change to the fifth degree of the scale. century addition to the system uh, uh, so here the ensemble play all together and the music is usually composed then 
there is a large section called Avaz. Avaz is the actual you know, system where the DASCOS system actually is improvised. This, through the Avaz, the performer actually improvises on, on the different gouches and, um, and uh, start with that on with the introduction, goes to different gouches and also insert the take case. Then after that, there is a composed piece, if there's a singer, there's a composed piece that the singer will actually sing with the ensemble called Tasnif. And usually, the performance ends with a something very upbeat, um, kind of a very upbeat and happy called Reng. Reng comes from the Indian word, word Ranga. And essentially might be actually uh, related to Indian music. So, and essentially, it's, very, it's somewhat dance piece. So the idea is that people should actually leave the performance happy. Now, um, at, at this point, I would like actually to show you some of the examples of uh, the Persian instruments and maybe play a little bit because we are running out of time. Uh, play a little bit of uh, the examples of some of them. Um, here you have a, a tar, which is the Persian lute. Here is the setar. Here is santur, which Dr. Sahafi will actually do the performance. A ney. Um, here is kamanche, the Persian uh, fiddle. Pechak, which is actually a very old instrument, uh, mostly performed in the south of Iran. This is the grandfather of the lute. It's called barbat, and it's the Persian oud uh, called the barbat. Um, and this is the Persian um, uh, uh, percussion instruments, uh, tombak. Sorry. And on the left side is the daf. And. Uh, here, this, these are the uh, Persian folk instruments, uh, dotar, dotar means two string, and tambour. This is rebab, very much like the Indian uh, sarud. And I'm going to go back, I'm going to play actually a little bit of um, the, um, um, the examples that, um, of the setar. This is set off. Did you see that he actually the, the drummer has to follow him and he go all of a sudden go da -da 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 -da, and the drummer has to go. It's just very much like the tabla player and the sitar player in actually in, 
in an Indian music. So you will see the, the connection between Indian music and the Persian music. So uh, here it's in, in a lot of detail actually, they like, relate to each other. Um, the next one I wanted to um, actually play is the Persian flute called Ney. The Ney is uh, very much performed all over the Middle East, except in Iran, they actually perform it differently. They put inside of the mouth and anchoring it on the front teeth. This is a technique was developed in 16th century in the city of Isfahan, and it's called the Isfahan technique. It's very difficult, and essentially the sound goes inside of the mouth, goes into the sinus cavities and come back. So then you will hear an incredible sound, which is a, a very, um, very uh, warm, and also has lots of overtones. Now we are actually uh, listening to a great master of uh, a Persian name. His name again is Hossein. Omumi. Actually, it's also in Homayun, by the way. Mm -hmm. 